We're going to finish up Ruth this morning. We are going to be in the most exciting, most compelling, most adventurous, most spellbinding passage in this entire book. Ruth chapter 4, verses 18 through 22. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron, Hezron fathered Ram, Ram fathered Amenadab, Amenadab fathered Nashon, Nashon fathered Salmon, Salmon fathered Boaz, Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. Let's pray. Father, we are so incredibly thankful to have you heard. God, in your word, offer us, your people, a clear revelation of who you are. God, a clear revelation of what it is to know you, to be part of your redemptive story, and a clear revelation of how we are to live in this world, in light of who you are and who you have redeemed us to be. And yet, Father, we come to passages like this one. And Father, if there's anybody here who is like me, God, it's so easy to look at a list of names like this and to go, what on earth does that have to do with me? God, I pray this morning, in the next several minutes, that you would convince us that Every part of this word that you've given us, including this list of seemingly inconsequential names, is absolutely vital to our understanding of you, your gospel, and your kingdom. Help me now. Help us now. Not as I preach and as we hear. Give us open ears. Give us eager minds and hearts. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, <clears throat> the book of Ruth, man, doesn't it just end on this incredibly exciting note? It ends with a genealogy, a list of names that goes all the way from the beginning of the tribe of Judah in uh, the person of Perez, all the way through ten, 10 generations that are named to King David. And what I want to do this morning is to show you uh, how really important a list of names like this is and what God is trying to communicate <coughs> to us through it. I want you to see that God works through unexpected people to establish his upside-down kingdom. God works through <coughs> unexpected people. Now, <clears throat> we're not going to spend time on all of these names in this list. I want to hit some highlights because I think it's, it, it really points out the fact that God does things in an unexpected way. Take Perez, the first man whose name heads up the list. Perez was one of two sons of Judah and Tamar. Perez was at the head of the line of the tribe of Judah. That's why things here start with him, because that's the line that Boaz was part of. It's obviously the line that David was part of as well. But here's the thing with Boaz. I mean, here's the thing with Perez. He, his birth was the result of an illicit encounter between Judah and Judah's daughter-in-law, Tamar. You see, Tamar dressed herself up as a prostitute and tricked her father-in-law into sleeping with her. Genesis 38. It's in there. Read it. Right? Now, the interesting thing is, Genesis 38 comes right on the heels of the introduction of the most righteous person in the book of Genesis, in chapter 37. You know who that is? Joseph. Genesis 37, we are introduced to Joseph, the only person in the book of Genesis about whom nothing negative is said. 
And then we have this strange story of Judah and Tamar in chapter 38, and we're right back to the story of Joseph in chapter 39. What in the world is up with that? The whole point is to say to us, the readers of Genesis, that the promise of God doesn't follow the lineage of the person who's expected, Joseph. Instead, it follows the lineage of this completely unexpected person, Perez. Which is to say that God's purpose and plan and story revolves around his scandalous grace. His grace that ultimately chooses unexpected people to accomplish his extraordinary purposes. So that's where Perez comes from. And then, if you go down a little bit further in the list, you find the name Selma. Now, I can't help but think of the fish right, when, when I read that. But Salmon fathered Boaz. And if you know anything, again, about the history that's come before, Salmon was the husband of... Rahab the harlot. All right? Rahab the harlot, a Canaanite who aided the escape of the Jewish spies from Jericho. Right? She was an outsider. She was a, a, an unexpected participant in the story of redemption. Someone, really, that you would never expect to find as part of God's story. And then, of course, it says, Salmon father Boaz. And Boaz fathered Obed. Who did he father Obed by? By who was also an outsider, who was also a Canaanite. Remember, she was a Moabitess. The, the Moabites were an ancient enemy of the people of God. And nobody, nobody reading this for the first time would have expected that God would have plucked her out of her idolatrous faith and her country and made her part of his story of redemption. And then you go all the way through ten generations to King David. And remember King David and how King David became part of God's story. Among Jesse's sons and David's brothers, David was the very last one that anybody expected to be the Lord's choice to lead his people. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. You can go look at that passage when you have time later. But Samuel is told by the Lord to go to the home of Jesse to anoint one of his sons as king. He's not told which one. So what he does is he naturally thinks that, wow, this is going to be the biggest, the strongest, the oldest son. So he lines them all up. And one by one, the Lord says, nope, not that one. Nope, not that one. Nope. Nope, not him, not him, until he gets to the end. And he says, I give up. Jesse, you got any more kids? <laughs> and Jesse says, well, there's one, the youngest. He's out tending the sheep. And Samuel says, well, go get him. And as soon as he walks into the room, the Holy Spirit says to Samuel, that's him. Anoint him. <coughs> Again, unexpected people to accomplish God's extraordinary purposes. These genealogies, this one in particular, is meant to highlight the fact, which we saw throughout the book of Ruth, that God is working in incredibly strange ways through people that the world would not expect to accomplish his great redemptive purposes. And the list of names at the end is meant to be a setup. Right? It's meant to set us up for what's to come in God's story. So that when we get to Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, and we read these words, we're not surprised. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Amenadab, and Amenadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, 
and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. Now that's only halfway through the genealogy of Jesus. But the genealogy at the end of the book of Ruth is designed to set us up for this genealogy of Jesus that includes a Canaanite prostitute named Rahab, Rahab a former Can Canaanite idolatrous woman named Ruth, a woman who dressed herself up as a prostitute to sleep with her father-in-law named Tamar. It's meant to set us up for this story where an angel comes to an unwed teenage girl and says, you're going to have a baby. And that baby is going to be the son of God. It's meant to set us up for the fact that this baby, this king, this son of God, is not born in a palace. He's born in a barn. He's laid in a cattle trough with all kinds of animals um, eating and going to the bathroom and smelling up the place all around him. Right? It's meant to set us up for the fact that God works through unexpected people in completely unexpected ways to accomplish his purposes. And guess what? These are the kinds of people that God uses to write his story of redemption. Why is that? Why is that? Because it's not about what any of the people named here brought to the table. It's not about what Mary brought to the table. It's not about what any of us bring to the table. It's a it's about God and His grace. Not about personal qualifications. It's not about intelligence. It's not about prowess. It's not about family connections. It's not about moral capacity. It's about God and His grace at work in the lives of unexpected people. Which is why we hear Paul say of the church in 1 Corinthians 1 these words. And they shouldn't surprise us. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. You see, you and I don't write stories like this. Only God uses the kinds of people that the world rejects, the kinds of people that we think, ah, that, that, that person doesn't deserve a starring role. Well, God does that to magnify his grace in the lives of people that the world would otherwise write off. And here's what I want you to do this morning, folks. Brothers and sisters, I, I, I want you to never, ever, ever write anyone out of God's story for that reason. Don't write anyone out of God's story because... This particular genealogy tells us that anybody, at any place, at any time, no matter their background, no matter the things they've done, no matter the things that have been done to them, can find a place and a part in God's story. Because it's all up to His grace. God delights in choosing and saving and using the most unexpected people in order to accomplish his extraordinary purpose. What do you think the next Billy Graham might be right now? Have you thought about that? What if the next Billy Graham is not growing up in an intact family and going to a private Christian school and playing on the best sports teams and all that kind of stuff. What, what if the next Billy Graham is growing up in a meth house? What if the next Billy Graham is surrounded by parents who neglect them, who feed their drug habit, and are only interested in packing their pockets full of cash? What if the next Billy Graham lives in those set of circumstances and only gets one meal a day? What if, the, what, if, what if the next 
Billy Graham is the one high on crack right now? What if the next missionary to that unreached people group in South America is selling her body every single night just in order to put food on her table for herself and her little girl? Do we think like that? No. We don't. We don't think like that. But that's what God's story tells us. That God delights in saving the unexpected and using the unexpected to make a mockery of the wisdom of the world. He does it in order to establish what the Bible, what the Bible pictures as an upside down kingdom. The kind of kingdom where the first are last and the last are first. God writes his story using unexpected people. The people in this list, the people who make up Jesus' genealogy, to prepare his people. For one person, one pivotal moment, and to show all of us what the pathway into the kingdom of God looks like. The one person is who? Jesus. I already said it. He's the king who came not to be served, but to what? <coughs> He's the king who came not to conquer and to kill, but rather to be conquered and to be killed. To be slaughtered on our behalf as the very Lamb of God who took upon himself the sin of the world. He's the king who came to give his life away as a ransom rather than demanding that his subjects give him something. The entire book of Ruth, the entire Old Testament, the fact that over and over and over, over again, God uses these unexpected people is meant to prepare us for the birth of the king who wouldn't even have a home. Who went to a criminal's cross and on the cross through death defeated death. Again, I tell you, who writes a story like that? We don't. God does that. And it's meant to prepare us for that one pivotal moment in Jesus life. Not his birth, but the moment that everything was driving to him in his ministry. That moment in that place where God would save the world, the cross, where Jesus the King of Kings would die the death of an outcast, a reject, a criminal, despised by Jews and Gentiles alike, and left, left all alone. It was there in that moment as Jesus bled out on a cross that the God of all creation was ruling over Satan, sin, death, and hell. Now it takes spiritual eyes to see that. Because to everybody standing around, that looked like the worst defeat imaginable for the Messiah. But it wasn't. In irony of ironies, through death, Jesus defeated death. That's how God works. And then there's the pathway. There's the pathway into this upside down kingdom. You see, these people in this sense, and Jesus himself and his death teach us that it's not the achiever who is reconciled to God. It's not the straight-A student. It's not the one who has the glowing report card. It's, it's not the one with the right family background who's written into God's story. It's not the one with the public shining example of perfect morality and behavior who gains entrance into God's family. It's those who know that they have nothing that they bring nothing to the table. It's those who know that they've made a wreck of their lives. It's the ones who know that they have nowhere else to turn. It's the humble. It's the unexpected. It's the reject. It's the outcast. 
It's the ones who know that they are least qualified who are welcome to sit at the table and to eat the master's food and to find their nothing turned into everything in Jesus. God throws open the doors of his kingdom. And he says to any and all who will hear the call to repent and believe in Christ, to come. And in that kingdom, here's what we find. We find that it's the last who are first of all. You find that it's the poor in spirit who are the richest of all. You find it's the ones who mourn who are comforted. You find it's those the world deems outsiders who become true insiders. You find that it's the world, the ones the world deems fools who are truly the wisest. There you find that it's only by dying that you find life. And there you find that it's only those who are know they are unrighteous who are then declared righteous in the sight of God. Now the Bible teaches clearly and unapologetically that there is only one way to be reconciled to God. That's it. One. Through Jesus Christ. He is the way and the truth and the life. And as a church, we stand on that truth. We teach that unapologetically. But for some in our world, that's scandalous to accept because how could there ever possibly be one way to God? Just one. But here's the thing. I want you to think about all the other ways that are out there that claim to be ways to All of them. All of them teach that you have to do something in order to be accepted by God. That you have to perform to a certain level or to meet a certain set of qualifications before you are deemed worthy of a relationship with Him. Hear this. Christianity, as it is represented in God's Word, is the only faith that throws open the doors and says, you don't have to do anything to be acceptable to God. In fact, you can't. You never did, you never can, and you never will. But the good news is, Jesus did it all. So, through Christ, it's not only those who have made it to give it. In fact, it's those who haven't made it. Those who've made shipwreck over their lives. Those who've failed every class. Those who've been rejected at every job interview. Those who have known nothing, nothing, but pain and heartache and sorrow over their sin in their lives. Those are the ones who are in. So here's the good news. If you blow this one. If your life is in shambles, if you feel like you don't belong here or there or anywhere, the gracious and compassionate God of Ruth, the gracious and compassionate God of Tamar, the gracious and compassionate God of Rahab, the God of steadfast love who welcomes the failure and the dropout, the tired, the outcast, the weary, and the worn is ready to receive you. Will you acknowledge your need and run to Jesus? I promise you. I promise you, people will cast you aside. If we have seen anything in the book of Ruth, it is that He is a God of devoted, generous, redeeming, and resurrecting. If you are here this morning and you've come to the end of the road and the end of the road, guess who's waiting right here? Him. Yeah. He will not cast you aside. This morning we're going to receive the Lord's Supper. And I want to remind you that this sacred meal 
is for everyone who has run into the arms of Jesus. It's for everyone who calls him Savior. It's for everyone who has come to the end of their road and said, Jesus, I can't do it. I give it to you. It's an open invitation to any and every citizen in his upside-down kingdom to come and to sit at his table and to be reminded that though you did not once belong, there's a place for you. There's a seat for you. And it's at the king's end. This is an opportunity to come and to be reminded of all that Christ did for you. That you might have that seat. That you might have that love. And it's a reminder that you and I come not based on our own merits, but on the basis of what Christ has done. Close your eyes for just a second. I want you to hear, I want you to hear these words from Isaiah chapter 55. If you know the Lord Jesus this morning, this is your invitation to his table. If you don't know him this morning, I want to encourage you. Don't, don't come to the table because this isn't for you yet. Take Christ. Take him. Isaiah 55. Come. Everyone who thirsts, <clears throat> come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good. And delight yourselves in rich food. <clears throat> oh, Father.